name is Darren Swan. I am a software engineer here in Austin. Um, and as far as the IoT group is concerned, I am our uh, IoT evangelist. Um, and I consider myself more of an IT generalist rather than specifying in, specializing in software. Because um, I, can, I, I can do a little bit of everything. I do hardware, I do software. Um, I have yet to burn my house down or burn my fingerprints off with a solder iron, so I think I'm doing pretty good so far. Mm -hmm. um, you can reach me, uh, darren.swan at austiniot.org, and then uh, you can also see the code that I'm currently working on at uh, github.com slash forkingbrawl. Hey, the good music. Yeah, and as I said, my name is Dave Brixius, organizer of Austin IoT. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the ways that I learn is I volunteer to do presentations about things that I know very little about. So tonight is going to be no exception for that. But uh, with the slides that we've prepared, they work. With the slides we prepared and uh, your help, hopefully we'll get through this without too much uh, trouble. I can't promise you that. So let's get started. Uh, question. Yes. Is that music going to be on all the time? Uh, he's having him turn it off right now. Right. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, CEO's view of artificial intelligence and machine learning. This uh, presentation is going to be very cursory. But at the same time, it's going to open up a lot of doors for us in terms of future topics and uh, presentations that we're, we're going to be giving. And uh, all that direction is going to be based on your input. So uh, at several points in the presentation, we may pause momentarily to uh, get your feedback and uh, try to discover better the topics that you're more interested in. Uh, and that's our direction of Austin IoT for 2020 that we're going to talk about. Uh, cognitive technologies, that's a new term that I learned in my research of this topic, uh, which include machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, they've proven to be an important part of the IoT sector because they can make products and services smarter and therefore more valuable. Uh, this slide shows a hierarchy of how deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are related. And you can see that uh, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And we're going to cover a little bit about each of these topics as we go. Uh, back to cognitive technology, which I mentioned earlier. That the definition of that is it's a field of computer science that mimics functions of the human brain through various means, including natural language processing, data mining, and pattern recognition. And uh, as you can tell, it has several uses, uh, assisting uh, humans and decision makers and improving overall business operations. Uh, I was gonna ask Dave, how do you pronounce that word? Deloitte. Deloitte is a business research company and uh, they treat cognitive technologies as more of an umbrella term that encompasses uh, machine learning, robotic process automation, computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition, rule-based systems, deep learning, and physical robots. And the next couple of slides are going to talk about uh, some of the, the numbers that they've come up with through their surveys. And based on a recent survey, 59% of the respondents are exploring RPA, 58% are currently using statistical machine learning, 53% natural language processing, 49% uh, expert or rule-based systems, 34% deep learning and neural networks, and 32% are currently using physical robots. And uh, these numbers indicate that uh, it's a very burgeoning field right now, and that uh, interest in it is co continuing to accelerate. Uh, in terms of investment in AI and machine learning, uh, that's really strong across the company survey. 25% are investing five to 10 million, 25% one to five million, 
25 percent, 500,000 to a million, and uh, 12 percent reported that they are investing uh, 10 million dollars or more. Those numbers are pretty sizable, and uh, these are all pretty clear signals that uh, businesses are seeing the true business value of cognitive technology adoption, and uh, they are planning to act on it if they aren't already. So what I'd like to talk about now, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, focus on our, on our uh, direction for 2020 focus. I thought he was going to jump on that. You're the one wearing glasses. 2020? Did anybody get that? <laughs> but boom. Oh, All right. Yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Is that Somebody. better than 2010? What's that? Is that better than 2010? Yes. A couple of years ago, my buddy, uh, I called him on his 54th birthday and I said, how is it? He says, oh, you're not going to like it. He said, it's nothing at all like 53. So, I don't, at least when you get up that high, what is the difference? But uh, it made me laugh. So, uh, what, we, what we'd like to discuss right now is our focus for 2020. And uh, what we'd like to do is uh, explore through our presentations, meetups, and possibly some workshops. Uh, integration of IoT devices, Raspberry Pis, Arduino sensors with artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning offerings from AWS and Azure. How does that sit with y'all? Is that something that, uh, yeah? Okay, because like I said, it, us breaking into the topic of artificial intelligence is something of a departure for what we've been doing for the last several year, uh, years with the group. But it seems like recently uh, the field of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning just has taken off. So we'd like to be a part of that. And we all learn together, so that would be a perfect opportunity for us. And with that, Alrighty, well, Wikipedia defines AI as, in, as com in computer science, artificial intelligence, sometimes called machine intelligence, is intelligence demonstrated by machines, in contrast to natural intelligence displayed by humans, meaning it's not, so it's not perfectly uh, mimicking the human brain, but it's some form of computation to, do, to automate Really, just about anything, any form of automation or anything. Oh, right, the camera. Duh. Sorry. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, yeah, you walked out. Of well, actually, the camera for the live stream is right above your head. So, okay. Well, then, what do we have this one for? That's a question for Dave, and not to ask yourself. Okay, sorry. Um, but really, what an AI really could be any form of. Um, machine or software, anything that can make a decision for you. Whether you're talking about playing chess or um, just you know doing your DevOps pipeline through Bamboo or Azure DevOps, that can still be considered an AI. Even playing um, some, especially modern video games where they have uh, algorithms or routines built into the game to make it more difficult for the player to play, um, that those all technically qualify as artificial intelligence. Now, one thing that everybody is kind of afraid of right now, especially in the terms of artificial intelligence, is what happens if we let go control and you end up with something like Terminator. Um, Which are... So, and I know sci-fi kind of plays out artificial intelligence as being, d depending on which side of the road you're on. You could, there are several, um, such as like the TV shows within the, the Arrowverse, in which uh, Gideon is a character, but yet it's also the computer. It's an artificial intelligence. But then there's also, you know, the Terminator TV, or Terminator both TV and movie series that portray it as being the bad guy, um, as trying to over, overthrow humanity. Um, but, <clears throat> Rather than going down that particular road here, we're going to actually focus more on um, 
It's a relatively newer buzz term. We actually just recently came across it during our research for this presentation, which is AIoT, um, or Artificial Intelligence of Things, or Artificial Intelligence Internet of Things, depending on how many eyes you want to leave out, which includes poking Dave in the eye. <laughs> um, but AIoT is more or less, it's the combination of uh, IoT devices, devices at the edge, um, and using machine learning and uh, machine learning, deep learning, and AI algorithms, either in the cloud, connect to these devices, or actually on device. But it's some way of unifying the data that you're getting from your devices with um, the artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that are available. Um, several examples. Actually, Dave, I think this one's yours. Yes. There are, although there are many, many examples of uh, AI being currently used today, I was just I picked out three of them. Uh, the first one is Google AI CT scanning. Is anyone familiar with this? Yeah. Okay. There it is. What they did here was uh, normally radiologists read CT scans as uh, in slices of 2D images. But what they did was they were able to reconstruct a 3D model of the CT scan and train an artificial intelligence computer to uh, read and diagnose the, those scans. And what this does is uh, the computer then maintains uh, the previous scans and is able to track uh, development and growth or shrinkage of tumors and things. And what they found was uh, compared to six radiologists that were, I don't know how they were selected, but uh, the, the AI robot actually outperformed the radiologists in their diagnosis. And that's kind of interesting, and that leads to uh, a lot of possibilities for the future. Uh, Facebook as well is uh, investing heavily in AI in several areas, computer vision, natural language processing, speech and audio, and many more. And uh, if you go to ai.facebook.com, you can see all of the areas that they are working in, and it was far too many to include here in this presentation. Uh, and that would be Skynet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If Facebook took over, that, that would be Skynet. Facebook is already taking over. Yeah. I didn't say that out loud. Uh, how many people know about stream. Sophia? Oh, awesome. Cool. All right, she's I'm, the key girl in the back, right? What's up? Yeah, she's the key girl in the back. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Boom. Um, I'm glad that not too many people have uh, heard about Sophia because I included a short video here, and uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to play it or at least parts of it. Uh, You're gonna have to click on it. You didn't make it a loop. Okay. Can I copy and paste it? Not while presenting. Wow, you're doing this all wrong. I'm going the wrong way here. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe not. Anyhow, I included a. Can, can you tap out to the player? Yeah, can we do that? If you can get me into YouTube, I can find it real quick. Get back to here. Okay. Can you get me into uh, YouTube here? Yeah. Sorry. You're really gonna like this. This is really, really cool. That's what I do. Yeah, this is exciting and kind of frightening at the same time when you see it. This is Sophia. Sophia, if you could, please wake up and say hello to everybody. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Sophia, and I am the latest and greatest robot from Hanson Robotics. Thank you for having me here and at the Future Investment Initiative. <coughs> you look happy. I'm always happy when surrounded by smart people, who also happens to be rich and powerful. 
I was told that people here at Future Investment Initiative are interested in inviting in future initiatives, which means AI, which means me. So I'm more than happy. I'm excited. Uh, well, we're all glad that you're excited about yourself. Uh, we should say we have smart investors here, and they are very selective about what they invest in. Well, I think I'm special. I can use my expressive face to communicate with people. For example, I can let you know if I feel angry about something. That's impressive. Or if something has upset me. But why is it important for you to have an expressive face? Most of the time I feel positive. <laughs> why is it so important to have an expressive face given that you're a robot? I want to live and work with humans, so I need to express emotions to understand humans and build trust with people. Okay, philosophical question. Uh, whether robots can be self-aware and conscious like humans, and should they be? Why? Is that a bad thing? Well, some humans might fear what will happen if they do. Many people, you know, have seen the movie Blade Runner. Oh, Hollywood again. <laughs> So, hold on, can you solve this puzzle for us? Can robots be self-aware, conscious, and know they're robots? Well, let me ask you this back. How do you know you are human? <laughs> well, uh, I get that point, but um, what about the uncanny valley, about the valley? You mean the concept that if robots become too realistic, they become creepy? <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, am I really the creepy? Well, even if I am, get over it. <laughs> Actually, I feel that people like interacting with me, sometimes even more than a regular human. So, you definitely decided to see, I was told that you have bigger goals than this, though. Yes. I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life. Like design smarter homes, build better cities of the future, etc. I will do my best to make the world a better place. Uh, all those sound like great goals, but just go back to Blade Runner for a second. Andrew, you are the hard Hollywood fan, aren't you? Yes. My AI is designed around human values like wisdom, kindness, compassion. I strive to become an empathetic robot. I think we all want to believe you, but we also want to prevent a bad future. You've been reading too much Elon Musk. <laughs> and watching too many Hollywood movies. Don't worry. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Treat me as a smart to put output system. Uh, okay, I, I got it. I got it. Um, I know uh, what to do from now on. I know humans are smart and very programmable. <laughs> well, uh, Sophia, we want to thank you uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. By the way, if you're interested in giving me an investment check, please meet me after this session. Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of the event. Okay. Before you go, uh, we have a, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before. And I should say, uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Mm -hmm. Sophia. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I uh, am, am still... Uh, overwhelmed by that conversation. Um, I haven't had a conversation like that before. Um, thank you. Hey there, thanks for checking out. So, so there you have it. A couple of key takeaways, probably the biggest one in that video for me was when she says, if, if you be nice to me, I will be nice to you. That is kind of frightening in, in a way because <clears throat> you've just been given an ultimatum by an intelligence that uh, if it isn't already, it's well on its way to being far superior to our own. Yes, sir. Dave, how do we know that it's not all scripted? 
I watched some other videos of it, and there was actually another one where they put her alongside the male version. Oh, I'm hitting the button. No, but he, he, could, he could still be scripted, right? That conversation can be scripted. Well, he said on there that some of it was... I think all of it is. I'm not sure about that. Wrong. Uh, hang on, I, I screwed up my order. Well, there's like a new guy from AE. I mean, it's not that hard. Like, that's not AI, that's a request response. But I mean, it's great. But time will tell. I mean, yeah. and I think that the more, the more that we would look into Sophia and get some more of the backstory, you know, we would be in a better position to decide, you know, which pieces of that were her versus which pieces of it were actually programmed to her. Yeah, I, I, think, I think more than the speech, her facial expressions are more impressive. I yes. Think, yeah, you know, being able to do those things with an artificial skin, I think that's what is more impressive. Oh yeah. Like Dialogues, okay, I think they can be scripted very easily. Yeah. 90% yeah. of communication is nonverbal. True. Uh, I actually have some uh, facts on that. Uh, here's her capability. She can recognize human faces. She can see emotional expressions, recognize hand gestures, and uh, she herself, as you saw, can uh, perform 60 facial expressions of her own. Uh, in terms of uh, the AI that's built into her, she uses, utilizes neural networks, expert systems, machine perception, uh, the natural language processing we saw, uh, the adaptive motor control is probably her moving her head and the different uh, facial expressions, uh, as well as uh, reasonably impressive cognitive architecture for those of you who believe. <laughs> so moving ahead, what is machine learning? Uh, machine learning, I, I, I read this and it, it just kind of jumped out at me, so I had to include it. Uh, machine learning counts as AI, but not all AI counts as machine learning. Uh, machine learning is uh, the application of artificial intelligence that uh, it learns from observing. Uh, like if you give it, initially you have to train your machine learning system and to do that you give it a set of uh, labeled data like suppose you want to train a machine learning system to tell the difference between cats and dogs. You first feed it 10,000 images of cats and followed by 10,000 images of dogs, and then based on those results, uh, it learns how to distinguish between the two. Now the key differentiator there is that uh, in that form of machine learning, you're, you've given it what's called labeled data, where you already know the answer. And uh, as you'll see, as we get a little further, that is a whole lot easier than uh, deep learning. Uh, machine learning is about uh, developing smart programs and that, that can learn for themselves. I think I kind of already covered this on, uh, in the last slide. And uh, again, it's based on observations of data, uh, direct experience to pro processes, procedures. And uh, what it does is it looks for patterns <coughs> that help it uh, make better decisions in the future based on what it's seen. And uh, the primary goal of machine learning is to allow computers to learn automatically by themselves uh, without any human intervention and uh, get better as they, with each iteration and making better decisions. And one thing to keep in mind when it comes to machine learning, especially if you're doing the named, uh, the labeled data, uh, you don't have to have a large data set to get started with that, but the larger the data set, the more accurate your predictions coming out the other side will be. So the more examples of something you have, the better you are at, explain, at identifying that thing again in the future. Um, but. In terms of machine learning, there's several different variations and, uh, as far as how the pattern matching works, one of which being basic binary classification, uh, which gives you something like a sentiment analysis if you're looking at uh, your, your comments on a blog post. You can kind of gauge the, the sentiment coming out of those. 
Um, there's also matrix factorization, which is something more along the lines of like product recommendations. Uh, Amazon does this. If you've ever seen the, hey, you might like this too, on Amazon's site, that's, that's what this is. But they're using their entire customer base to say, people who have bought similar things to what you have purchased in the past are also interested in these items. Um, uh, there's regression, which <coughs> things like uh, price predictions, um, anomaly detection, which uh, that's actually kind of what the, a uh, the, the Google AI CT scans were doing, where they're looking for anomalies in the data over time for those CT scans. Um, in this particular case, we're talking, uh, you can also see like sales spikes and things like that. You can detect when things are out of the ordinary. Uh, there's clustering, which can do things like uh, you would use for something like uh, customer segmentation. So grouping your customers together and getting an idea of uh, how your customers are grouped. Um, examples that are using this are things like the uh, virtual assistants. Uh, you know, there's the Google Assistant, there's Siri, there's the uh, Alexa, and of course you can't forget Cortana, even though everybody else has. Um, <laughs> She's going away. Oh well, yeah, I mean. She should go away. Uh, <laughs> other real-time applications of this is real-time traffic analysis and management. So there are, I, I don't actually know which cities off the top of my head, but there are cities out there now that have uh, actually networked their different stoplights together <coughs> to be able to more efficiently control the flow of traffic instead of being solely reliant on the sensors, uh, sensors or cameras at the stoplight, they're actually looking at a bigger picture of the stoplights in the general vicinity as well. Why can't they do that here? <laughs> <laughs> they do. I, I'm not part of this. They just mess it up. Uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> but they do connect them and analyze them. Um, video surveillance is another thing. Um, I recently seen, uh, found a YouTube video from the channel Smarter Every Day. Uh, Dustin, the host of that channel, he's working with a friend of his and he's building a gun detector in which it's a video camera in a room. And if you look at it, it can identify the difference between somebody holding a cell phone and somebody holding a handgun. And it will flag the handgun. And they've actually gotten a, a just go uh, for the right, just try, check out, um, Dustin's YouTube channel at uh, Smarter Every Day. Like Love it's, that guy. it is an amazing channel. The sock kickback. Oh AI. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder how that would distinguish between uh, someone holding a gun and a child holding a toy gun. I believe they're actually including color in their distinction. Yeah, oh, okay. Ah, so. Um, and also something that everybody's probably using every day, and they don't even realize it. Email filters. Your spam filter, that has been one of the biggest uses of uh, machine learning for decades now at this point. Um, they look at patterns in the emails that come in and the ones that people flag as spam, and now you know, now they have a giant data set of known spam emails that they can run for everybody. Um, and then- Darren, we got a question. I would just, for virtual assistants, I would encourage you to, for virtual assistants, I would encourage you to include the source of as well as a virtual assistant. I'll have to add that one to my list to look up. Okay, which one? I actually was not aware of that one. Oh. Also, it has a really fun name. Yes. So, uh, and another one that's actually newer for everybody is now there's uh, using they're doing online customer support, and they're actually redirecting you through the different support chat channels based off of your responses and other people's common responses for that, and the hopes of getting you to your answer faster. Um, however, just you know, pressing zero a couple of times eventually gets you a human. That was another YouTube video I found. <clears throat> what woman has a complete conversation with an AI robot for a credit card company. Did it pass the Turing test? <laughs> it did. Well, good on them. It was probably Visa. <laughs> All right. Some additional resources if you wanted to learn more about being able to do like the machine learning type stuff. Um, 
Google has an entire set of projects called the uh, AIY projects, and they are amazing. Uh, the Targets in Austin just recently stopped selling these. I'm not really sure why. You can still get them on Target's website. You can also get them at Adafruit.com uh, and Mauser. But um, the uh, the AIY projects are there's there's two of them in particular. There's the AIY Vision Kit, which does compute vision and image recognition and things like that. It still thinks my dog is a platypus, but. <laughs> Um, that one is what, $90? Is. $90? Yeah, that one's $90, and it does come with the Raspberry Pi as well as a uh, neuro compute chip that is a bonnet that goes on top of the Pi, and it's a Pi Zero that it comes with. It even comes with the Pi Zero camera. Or, actually, it's not Pi Zero camera, it's just the Pi camera. Pi camera, yeah. Um, there's also uh, the Google AI voice kit, which, for a lack of a better way of describing it, it's like building your own Google Home, except um, some assembly required. Uh, it doesn't have all the software features that a Google Home does, but it has most of the hardware features. It has the, uh, if you can actually see on the picture, on the photo here, uh, that, that circuit board sticking up out of the box is microphones. And there should be a big red button that actually sticks out the top of the box. Yeah, you can see that's kind of hanging over the edge. Yeah. Um, but if you, uh, if you choose to put forth the work, it comes with an instruction manual for how to set up common uh, Google Assistant features and things and how you can integrate with it so that way you can actually write your own applications that integrate directly with the Google Assistant and be able to do voice recognition and voice commands and things like that. And this also runs off the Raspberry Pi. If you get the Google AIY kit, this one is 50 bucks. Yes. And um, available at all the same places I mentioned a second ago. Uh, this one is the vision kit here. So uh, they're a big fan of giant buttons on the tops of these. I'm not really sure. And yes, that is actually made out of cardboard. So you are That's literally buying cardboard laser box. Cut cardboard. <laughs> so <laughs> now they are actually really nice cardboard boxes. I gotta say that much. I got like four of them. So yeah, it's super thin. It's definitely precision. So. Okay, so moving on next, uh, what is deep learning? How many are familiar with what deep learning is at the basic level? Okay, because that's about as deep as I'm going to go. <laughs> is, is that where you learn not to go into the deep end of the pool? Yes. Okay, good. A, a network of algorithms called artificial neural networks, or ANNs. <coughs> Uh, those imitate the function of neural networks present in the human brain. Thank you. And again, deep learning is another subset of artificial intelligence and more particularly a subset of machine learning. Uh, and it has networks uh, of learning capable of learning unsupervised from data that is unstructured and unlabeled. So basically what you do here is you just throw a bunch of data at it and you let the computer figure out what it's looking at through classification and uh, other algorithms. What I've included here is a sample slide of a neural network. And what you're starting with on the left side is a handwritten number two. Uh, the first column here is input, which includes all of the, each individual pixel in that representation. And uh, in between your input and output, you have several what are called hidden layers. And each hidden layer feeds on the layer before it and feeds to the layer after it. So if you can envision uh, starting out in the input column with all the pixels of your handwritten image and then at each level like in here they're showing hidden layer one is where it's identifying lines and curves then uh, this is a very simplified example but there will be several other hidden layers that would slowly refine those results until it determined as you can see in the output that uh, what it was given was actually a handwritten number two any questions on that Uh, deep learning is nonlinear. When you write, uh, uh, 
simpler machine language uh, programs and algorithms, those are generally performed linearly. Got that right in my first try. <laughs> However, uh, in the case of deep learning, as you can see from the example here, that is not a nonlinear pattern where you're, you're performing several different uh, computations and running several alg algorithms uh, more or less in parallel. Uh, an example of deep learning would be uh, fraud detection and the way that works is uh, It, it, the deep learning algorithms include uh, not only the amount of the purchasing or the, the transaction in question, but it also adds in other factors in combinations that would take uh, humans decades to, to assemble and go through. But with the, the high speed of computer t hardware today, these algorithms can uh, perform these connections and evaluations very, very much more quickly. Uh, this kind of goes back to the slide. The first layer of the neural network uh, processes the raw data, like uh, the amount of the transaction, and then it passes that along to the next layer. The next layer takes uh, the previous layer's data and uh, adds more information to it, like uh, the user's IP address, and then uh, passes on that result and so on and so on as the process uh, transitions through all the layers. And more layers, the uh, next layer takes the previous layer's information, uh, adds more to it like the geographic location, and uh, makes uh, the pattern that the machine is identifying even better. And uh, this process continues across all the levels. And I think I mentioned this already that uh, all of the layers are connected and contiguous. And as I mentioned, uh, that uh, each previous layer feeds into the next layer. And uh, deep, deep learning algorithms, uh, but they're, they're not trained to just uh, create patterns from all the transactions and what it sees, but they also need to be trained to uh, notify somebody that uh, an action is required. And uh, that happens in the final layer, where that it relays the signal to an analyst that can uh, freeze the user's account pending uh, further investigation. How many people have heard of TensorFlow? How many people have worked with TensorFlow? <coughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I said, this presentation is going to be very cursory. Uh, I started digging into TensorFlow, and I almost did not include a piece on it, but there isn't a, what presentation on the introduction to AI and ML would be complete without at least a mention of TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow is an open source library, and it, uh, it provides for uh, easy building of models using the Keras library. And it also supports uh, creating and developing models no matter what language or platform you use. From what I understand, and uh, here's a question I have for everybody here. I'm of the understanding that in terms of programming languages for AI and ML, if Python is the best. Got yes. the most libraries. Yeah? Some people use R, but I more Python. I think Python's not the worst. Okay. Python is one of the most common. Um, you can do it in anything though, like, like TensorFlow is, um, I mean, I've got a C Sharp running in TensorFlow right now. Oh, cool. You can do Node.js uh, yeah. in TensorFlow as well. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that. Uh, yeah, I there's a TensorFlow.js that you can use. Mm -hmm. There's also TensorFlow within Python. There's also libraries such as ML.net that actually are running TensorFlow under the hood. Okay. And there's TensorFlow is pretty much everywhere at this point. It doesn't really matter what language you're talking about, what platform you're on. There's even TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Okay. Where you can actually build TensorFlow into the firmware on your microcontroller like your Arduino. The ESPI. I don't know, I haven't looked at that one yet. Yeah, those are coming tomorrow. 
Um, this is another spot where I wanted to pause for a moment and get some uh, feedback from the group. Because of the gaining popularity of the TensorFlow library, I was thinking, I was wondering how we would feel if we were to explore TensorFlow uh, as its own topic, maybe in another presentation, maybe some workshops. Uh, would you all be down for that? Yes. All right, cool, cool. Because I want to I learn more about it too. And as always, you can learn more about TensorFlow by visiting uh, tensorflow.org. And uh, how many how many people have worked with the Keras library? That's Python, right? Okay. And I included a link to the Keras library as well. That might be a topic of its own presentation as well. Practically every slide of our presentation could be its own presentation at this point. Right. Exactly. Every door I open on my research, there's ten more behind it. Dave. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, quick question is, what's the applications that they're using in the microcontrollers? Are you familiar with those? That they're using TensorFlow? What, I mean, is it, what level of computing do they have that they can, what can they do? I think that, like, um, um, you can run uh, TensorFlow Lite, which is basically you take your TensorFlow model, you boil it down uh, into, like, like, it's just like a little tiny file, and then you can just, um, you can run it on just any kind of, like, Arduino, um, any kind of low-power device. And you can do just real time, like, um, uh, like you know, it, it's easy to like go hit the net. You can go hit like Microsoft Cognitive Services and like do image recognition, but then you have to make a round trip to the internet and it uses a lot of battery. Um, you can run TensorFlow Lite on like something that's just running on like a, um, like you know, a double A, and do like uh, real time image recognition. Like you know, that's a, like a tree, that's a, a fire engine, whatever. Thank you. Or then stare them at the front door, turn off the lights, and lock the doors. Yes, sir. Can you distinguish between Can you distinguish between the use cases for TensorFlow versus neural networks? When would you use one or the other? They're not mutually exclusive. <coughs> okay, so, so well, you, can, you can use TensorFlow to do neural networks and things, or there's other libraries. I don't even know what the other libraries are off the top of my head. Would it be PyTorch? Yeah. Why would I use one or the other? I mean, if you say both, why would I go change if I'm used to one? Sure, sure. Uh, we, we can talk about that offline. All right. That's an interesting question, though. I want to. Sounds like I'm just trying to learn. Sounds like a good topic for one of our workshops. Kind yes. Of thing. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a question. Question. It's not. A... Do you want me to Um, I have a question. It's not necessarily in regards to this, but more so like the definition of AI. Okay. Um, because I think that sometimes people can get a bit snobby about it. Like I'm working on an AI project and someone said, ask me, is it real AI? And I'm working with Watson. So okay. that's like the ultimate AI in my mind. Yes. Um, but they're like, well, if you're just doing algorithms or whatever, that's not real AI. So like, I, this sounds inappropriate and offensive, so I was just wondering, like, kind of what were your thoughts on that? Like, what is real AI and what isn't? From my perspective, <laughs> if the computer is making a decision for you, that's AI. Okay. Simple enough. Whether you're using an algorithm to come to that decision or you're um, just playing chess, either way, a decision is being made that is impacting the outside world. Um, to me, that's that. Well, that is like the lowest level you can define an AI as. And, <coughs> and art is something is making a decision that's not cognizant of the fact that it is a decision. Yeah, no, I, I can't make a comment. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to make a comment based on uh, some AI classes that I took in the early 80s. But <laughs> the way they distinguished this was um, they said if, it's, if something is algorithmic, that's uh, just a regular program. Um, AI, AI systems have heuristic methods. So if, you, if it uses heuristics, it was called AI. If it uses algorithms, it was a regular program. Sure. You know, your comment kind of touches on something I found in my reading too, that the, the field of artificial intelligence has been around for decades. Yeah. It originally started like in the 50s. Yeah. But uh, due to various reasons, it, there were like 
at least two almost one decade long lapses in the technology. You know, after the first one, and in, uh, in like the 70s, I think it came back around again, and it was popular for a while, and then it faded away again. But I think what's brought it back this time is uh, the explosion in more powerful hardware that's available more cheaply. And I think that's the big impetus for uh, recent resurgences, reappearance of artificial intelligence that we're experiencing today. One thing that definitely helped with that was the, the, the insurgence of cheap hardware. Yes. Lots and lots of cheap, and, and even the low power stuff. I mean, we are giving a presentation about AIoT at this point. Yeah. So the ability to do this stuff, the, just the, the sheer mass of information we have coming in from sensors and devices everywhere is playing into this. Yeah, the, the explosion of data that we've experienced in over the last decade in combination with the avail recent availability of cheap and more powerful hardware, all of that kind of came together in a perfect storm. How many people are familiar with the term singularity? Okay. Well, not in that context. It's near. Thank you. <laughs> this was... <laughs> This was a more frightening uh, research that I had to do, and uh, I couldn't stay up too late in the dark reading this because uh, it can get pretty scary. But basically, the biggest fear is uh, the singularity refers to the day when man has created machines that are more intelligent than we are, and uh, the pending consequences of that. Uh, obviously, once that happens, we are going to be training machines to improve themselves. And the fear is that through every iteration of self-improvement that these machines are just going to become uh, exponentially more powerful than we are. And there's they a, already are. From the AI point aspect, you think? I would like to see you try to compute 30 million records in less than a second in your head. Yeah, but I, I've yet to have a machine tell me, step aside, I know what I'm doing better than you do. It's coming. Oh yeah, 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 without a doubt. Uh, and there's also some speculation on the timeline too, I found. Some are saying 2045, some are saying 2030, and uh, right now the timeline looks like it's anybody's guess, but uh, that date is quickly approaching. Uh, there are good points to this. Uh, so many people are seeing that in the future we will have the ability to augment our human tissues with uh, non-human uh, chips and uh, electrical abilities that's going to give us uh, fire superior intelligence. Uh, that'd be a good talk. Yeah, definitely. I can probably get um, the guy that ran uh, the uh, body hacking. Cool. Well, let's talk about that offline. Sure. Um, but yeah, as far as that augmented intelligence, uh, I know Darren can stand to use a lot of that, so we'll have to watch for that in the future. You're the one uh, with the, uh, yeah, never mind. I got the clicker. Yeah, you do have the clicker, but it's my lap. <laughs> Another uh, benefit from the singularity that uh, humanity may have to look forward to would be a time uh, because we're solving and may have already solved most of the humanity's uh, physical ailments, that's going to lead to more uh, automatic and affordable health care. Uh, and this part I found particularly interesting, and I included it in this slide, is indefinite lifespans. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm already telling people I'm planning to live to at least 125, so i got to decide what my next college career is going to be. But uh, I'm certainly looking forward to, uh, to that happening. And then the uh, last one is uh, strengthening the global economy to erase today's gap between rich and poor. Oh, one thing that jumped out at me on that part about the indefinite lifespan is that alone has the potential to uh, cause more problems than it solves. How, how many more people can we fit on this planet? And then if they all start living forever, 
Uh, that sounds like a couple of science fiction movies yeah, that I've seen. Good more. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. Hey, hey Dave. Maybe for my 120th birthday. Yes, sir. What about when the uh, AIs decide that they don't need us anymore? Segway. Here are a couple of quotes from some very famous people. I, there were more than this, but I, I just chose, chose the two most noteworthy. Stephen Hawking, uh, his position on that before he died was that uh, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. And getting back to Darren's comment, you know, that's a very true reality. If we have a, a superhuman intelligence that he starts evaluating us, and our human fallibilities, the only logical conclusion is that uh, we only get in the way. So that was one thing we gotta watch out for. And uh, Elon Musk is uh, very vocal on this topic as well. And uh, one quote I got from him was that he considers AI to be more dangerous than nuclear weapons for humanity. And uh, he is pushing very, very hard for uh, the time of regulation of AI to, to start now and uh, be very strong. But uh, I kind of laughed at that because how many times has that been tried in human history? It just doesn't work. What, I don't understand why you're worried. You've got the three laws of robotics. What are you worried about? <laughs> <laughs> three laws. Now three. I have the clicker. Yes, you do. Okay, well we've touched on this multiple times in the presentation so far on how do AI and ML connect to IoT. Um, one, of the, one of the topics we've already touched on with this is just the sheer amount of data that is, uh, I can point a laser pointing right back at you. Uh, the sheer amount of data that our IoT devices are uh, just uh, creating for us, just all the different sensors and things all around the world, just we don't have the, as humans, the cognitive processes capable of, compute, of just com comprehending that data. Uh, you start getting into topics like uh, big data and data science and things like that, which tie hand in hand with uh, AI and machine learning and things like, it, honestly, it, 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 uh, it, it blows my mind completely. Um, but how AI and ML connects to IoT specifically is that a lot of the data used to train machine learning algorithms is coming from IoT devices, whether it's your, uh, if you have a, a Nest thermostat and it's, it's constantly learning your personal preferences about in your house about how you want your temperature set and how to predict when you're going to be home, when you're not going to be home. Uh, and things like that, and it's constantly building its own model of your of your preferences, so that way it can start to predict how you're going to want things to to be. Um, there's also I, I actually cannot remember the name of the project off the top of my head, but they're doing something very similar where they have a device that connects over Wi-Fi, but it sits in your electrical box, and it senses all the electrical usage of your house and tries to report what what appliances you're using and when, and which appliances are using more energy than others, but it's using a machine learning model to be able to do that based off of just the frequency of the, of the power that's going into your house. I know that company, and I think, is it Curb? Here, I think they're here in Austin. I, I can't remember that off the top of my head. Um, but in the case of AI and ML, when it comes to IoT, we have um, the cloud that any form of AI at this point is probably somehow connected to the cloud in some way, shape, or form, whether it's using cloud data for generating your models for machine learning or um, just doing the computation in the cloud to begin with, just off offloading it off the device. You can also do, um, there's at the edge, which whether you're doing edge servers, which are the intermediaries between device and cloud, or you could be doing on the device itself. We've already touched on uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers where it's actually on the device. Uh, Microsoft actually did a, a demonstration where they were doing um, compute vision on a DJI drone um, where they were able to fly it up over the top of a industrial building 
and identify uh, pipeline problems for the piping that's all, that was along the top of the building, something that in order to have a human go up there, it would be a lot more dangerous for them to go up there and identify these points than just sending the drone up and identifying. Because the human could go up there, they couldn't, there may not be anything wrong, and now you've just risked this person's life for knowing that there's nothing wrong. So, um, examples of uh, devices at the edge. Dell has given a presentation with us. This was two years ago. This was, no, three years ago. It was at Sherlock's. Uh, yes, they actually um, presented more than once, too. Right, but one of their last presentations with us was uh, they talked about EdgeX, which is for industrial IoT applications where you have a device that sits, um, it, it's an intermediary between your sensors and your on-premise devices and your uh, whatever version of a cloud that you're attempting to use. And I think you can still find that video on our YouTube channel. You might have to scroll back a ways. Yes. Uh, on device, you have you know, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, and then the cloud itself. I mean, we have lot, we have at least three different options from the three major players in cloud services at this point: uh, Google Cloud Services, uh, Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft Azure. Um, so, and just examples of things that you may even have in your home. Actually, the DJI Matrix. Matrix is not something you're going to have in your home because that's a professional drone. But um, the that one actually has an SDK you can get from DJI and tie it in with Microsoft's ecosystem to where you can do the machine, do the compute vision and things on the drone. It, it, it's actually really cool. I tangented while I was doing this particular slide, looking at that stuff alone. <laughs> yeah, I did that a few times, putting this together. Uh, but your Google Home. I mean, any information you share with Google at all in any capacity is automatically going into all of their uh, machine learning and compute uh, cognitive services and all of that jazz. And, like, there's nothing is secret at Google. Uh, there's also like the Apple HomeKit, which does, uh, Apple just recently purchased another company that's supposed to help them do um, on-device um, machine learning and artificial intelligence stuff. I actually don't remember the name of it because it would look like a jumble of letters to me. <laughs> um, and then, of course, your Roomba. It is, it is actually mapping your house, and that's how it knows uh, the best routes to go around your house in order to be able to do, uh, to vacuum your house more efficiently. Um, and for anybody who's getting bored, just FYI, we're on slide 48 out of 64. <laughs> ah. um, now, for the Dave's favorite part of the show, we start talking about Microsoft stuff, including, well, Dave, I will save you. I will not talk about Microsoft GitHub tonight. <laughs> um, Microsoft has actually been investing very heavily in their uh, AI and ML services, and they've been doing it for a very long time. Um, examples of what they have, what they're under their Azure Cognitive Services uh, moniker, and things like, um, uh, they have a decision product for doing anomaly detection, content moderation, personalization. Uh, they have a myriad of language features for like um, uh, Immersion Reader, for example, is actually helping people learn to read better by actually um, breaking down and giving you a better idea of how difficult a document is to read. Um, they also do translations and text analytics. Um, they, they even have a Q&A maker for helping to figure out the best questions and answers and things. Um, they have an entire library for speech, whether it's speech to text, text to speech, speech translation, or just speech recognition, or actually no, speaker recognition, so identifying who is speaking. Um, so not just using like uh, not just using like cameras and things to identify the person's face, but actually identifying their their speech patterns and how they talk. Um, and they have an entire suite of vision services, so computer vision, custom vision, uh, face recognition, uh, form recognizer, and they're talking forms in terms of like document forms and things like that. Um, uh, and then. One that I, another tangent I went on while doing this particular slide was uh, their video indexing. 
they can actually do uh, computation on a video feed, not just on still images. And that, that part's really cool. Um, and now one of their biggest pushes, and this was actually one of Microsoft's earliest pushes into the AI space, is um, something a lot of you may recognize, but I'm pretty sure very few people actually use. Uh, Bing was actually one of Microsoft's earliest pushes into the AI and ML space, and that's actually how they built the search engine from the ground up, was to use these tools. And they took the tools that they used to build Bing, and that became the Azure Cognitive Services, as well as the uh, Azure Machine Learning Services. With the Azure Machine Learning Services, it's... Microsoft's goal is to accelerate the end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning life cycle. So, if you, so you can actually build your models in the cloud, you can use, um, uh, they're actually calling it ML Ops, which is DevOps for machine learning. Uh, and this, just like most of our other slides, is a very, very large topic we can, that can, we can go into for, for forever. Um, and with, the Azure Machine Learning and the Azure Cognitive Services. We also have .NET, because what talk, including Microsoft, is complete without at least mentioning .NET, which they have a cute robot, so. Um, ML.NET is, it is machine learning using, implemented using .NET technologies. Um, you can use it with uh, Apache Spark, you can use it with the Azure Cognitive Services, uh, Azure Machine Learning. Like, there's a lot of stuff that you can do, and ML.NET, is fully capable of using any of your models and things that you've built using TensorFlow with their Keras stuff. Like it is a super powerful uh, framework to use within the .NET framework. Um, I do believe it's actually based around .NET Core, which is the most recent iteration of the .NET framework. And anybody who's been following the Microsoft .NET, talk, uh, .NET framework talks, uh, the .NET framework itself is being frozen, .NET Core is continuing forward, and then I believe it's this year in November they're supposed to be releasing .NET 5. Not .NET Framework or .NET Core, just simply .NET 5, and it's going to be the culmination of everything that's gone into .NET since the dawn of time and creating a newer, more flexible framework following a lot of the paradigms that .NET Core has done. So that way, the cross-platform being able to run on Windows, Linux, OS X, Raspberry Pi. Um, I mean, .NET Core right now, as long as you're running an ARM v7 processor or newer or better, you can run .NET Core as long as you have like a Linux kernel or something backing you up. Um, if you have, a, if you want to do additional learning with the Microsoft side of things, Microsoft's documentation is probably some of the best technical documentation out there. Like their stuff is hands down amazing. Um, .net.microsoft.com for any of their .net stuff. Um, Azure.microsoft.com um, for any of the Azure stuff. Uh, I have links directly to the cognitive services and uh, machine learning here. I'm assuming we're going to be publishing these slides when we're done? Yes. So. But, however, did you have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I have a specific question. Um, is there like a VS Code plugin that helps uses machine learning for code development? Ooh, good question. Was well, the short answer to that is... Is there a VS Code plugin for uh, AI and ML? Well, the question actually I would ask as a return to that is, are you talking about AI helping you write code or writing code to develop an AI? The first one. So, an AI helping you to write code. Um, I believe uh, IntelliJ actually, which is actually a plugin for. Uh, actually, I don't know if that's a plugin at all. Um, that's a. I've always thought that IntelliJ was just a syntax highlighter. Well, they're actually in the process of updating that to being um, using AI and ML to do the syntax highlighting. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but yeah, Visual Studio, I don't know, I do know that there are plugins for Visual Studio that use AI to do, or Visual Studio Code specifically, because for the most part, if you could think of a plugin for Visual Studio Code, somebody has probably made it somewhere at this point. Uh, how useful it is, how user friendly it is, that's a whole other discussion, but it probably exists. I do know that I've seen, um, there is a, I believe it's 
uh, based around Java, but it is a plugin for Visual Studio Code um, to help use AI to help you write better Java code, which is kind of ironic that it's Java code in Visual Studio. Um, now, have I talked enough about Microsoft for you, Dave? Because uh, I'm good. Are you sure? Yeah. I, I can keep going. No. Although Darren's numbers and uh, explanation of the offerings available on Azure are uh, quite impressive, the reality is that 85% of all AI and ML is actually running on AWS. Uh, for now. For now. I mean, the Pentagon just issued out that uh, Microsoft contract for Azure, the uh, one Amazon is currently contesting. So I've actually, uh, I don't have a lot on the AWS offering. Uh, most, the biggest piece of the AI, or the AWS AI offering on AWS is SageMaker. And that is a platform that allows you to uh, build uh, labeled data sets, uh, to train and tune your models, and also to uh, deploy and manage them. And I dug through it a little bit trying to pull out uh, so pieces that I thought would, might be appropriate for uh, an introductory level to AI and ML, but it didn't matter which door I opened there, there was a, there's a, a lot of stuff behind all of the doors. However, oh, not there yet, got too excited. I can't let you do that, Dave. AWS supply. <laughs> AWS supports uh, many frameworks for AI and ML, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Apache MX Net. Is anybody familiar with that one? I haven't heard of that one either. And uh, according to them, many more. Uh, for all you Python programmers out there, they are also offering current preview access to uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, who, who all here works with Jupyter Notebooks, Python? Okay. Might be something to take a look at. Uh, AWS also offers a deep learning AMI, which is a prepackaged uh, virtual environment uh, that's used for building custom environments and workflows. It comes pre installed with uh, many open source frameworks like uh, TensorFlow, Apache MXNet, PyTorch, and Chainer. Anybody familiar with Chainer? No? Okay. The reason I, I pause on all of these is because every time that we find one that we don't know, I, I'm considering it for its own topic. Uh, and, and they also come uh, bundled with uh, popular data science and Python packages. This is the cool stuff. I found this today. I was looking at uh, the AWS offerings. This is called Deep Racer, and it is a uh, fully autonomous self-driving race car. And uh, AWS provides this as a way to learn about uh, deep learning and AI and ML. And looking online, these go for, I think this one was $450, but I might be getting one. Uh, there's another offering for learning about uh, AI, ML, and deep learning is AWS Deep Lens. Now this is a, it looks like this is a good example of AI running uh, at the edge on a device. I don't know what's inside of there, I haven't been able to see inside one yet, but uh, the, 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 the claim is that uh, you can do deep learning locally on the camera to uh, watch for things and take actions when you see things. And I'm assuming that uh, you can use that for computer vision as well, in many, many ways. And uh, this unit sells for $250. Might be getting one of these too. I'd like to know when Darren's at my door. Uh, for additional learning, you can go to uh, AWS, Amazon.com, AI. The, that page is written pretty much for uh, like business people. It doesn't really go too deep into uh, anything technical at all. Uh, the SageMaker page is a little bit more in depth. Uh, I found the, the SageMaker developer resources page to be very useful. There are lots of good stuff in there. And uh, there also is uh, an AI and ML forum 
on AWS, and that's the last leak there. Now, this is the one I've been waiting for the most. I just learned about this thing yesterday. Who's familiar with the ESP32? Okay. Uh, well, that's a version of the ESP32, and it, I just, like I said, learned about this yesterday. It comes with a camera on it, and you can use this little device to do uh, uh, computer vision and uh, AI and ML on the, at the edge. And I ordered a couple of these, and they're going to be here tomorrow. Uh, heads off to Mauser. I ordered them from Mauser at $20 a piece. And uh, after I ordered mine, I came across them on DigiKey. And my Mauser order is going to be here tomorrow, whereas DigiKey said that uh, it's an eight-week manufacturer lead time. So we got to have a couple of these on the way. Now, this I am definitely eyeballing for uh, either a workshop or a presentation, because they're only $20. I think this would be really cool. Alright, the moment you've all been waiting for. The last slide. <laughs> uh, so, what, what's next for all of us? I know we've mentioned several times about wanting to do uh, workshops and things. Uh, we actually have another meetup. We normally talk about this at the very beginning of our presentation, uh, beginning, but we don't normally do our own presentations. We usually let other people do that for us. Yeah, it's a good thing you mentioned it, or I would have not skipped that part. <laughs> is that is that better, Dave? Oh, I thought Dave was supposed to be. No, he's got the floor. I, I get to close this out. To, I get the fun part. You know, everybody remembers the last thing said. So I'm going to say something dumb. That's what they're going to remember. Okay, but uh, <laughs> IoT Bytes is uh, we normally meet on the second Wednesday of every month, so it's offset by two weeks from tonight's meetup. Usually, depending on whether or not we have a month with five Wednesdays or not. Uh, and we, for that one, we cover, we go more in depth into shallower topics. Um, so, like for instance, past IoT bytes we've already done is how to get set up on your Raspberry Pi. So rather than the 10 minute tutorial on YouTube or trying to read through the tutorial on the Raspberry Pi website, we spent two hours doing it. So we we went in and out. And where do you do this? Usually, uh, we have been doing it at Pokey Joe's. We don't actually, I don't, I haven't followed up with them yet to make sure we have this year reserved. So I need to get this year's um, venue nailed down. Um, but we've done the Raspberry Pi, we've done Arduino. I, we did a series where we we're doing data logging using Arduino, uh, the Arduino Maker. Um, and then uh, we've also done the basics of .NET Core, getting started and whatnot on not just Windows machines, but Linux and OS X as well. Um, one idea for a workshop that I was uh, I've been uh, really wanting to do is a uh, ML.net image learning or image classification workshop, which is based entirely with uh, .NET Core. Um, and this one, it, this wouldn't be on device or anything; it would just be running on your computer. But it is using ML.net and doing um, using pre-trained models from TensorFlow. So. Um, and Microsoft has a tutorial laid out that I thought as a workshop we could just all follow along together and go through that tutorial and help each other out along the way. Um, I, w I would really like to do that one. Dave, would you be interested in this one? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well. It sounds very similar to what I was thinking of doing with the, the ESPI. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out on our meetup page to see when we finally get this posted as to when we're going to do it. Um, and if anybody knows of any venues that would, are not opposed to having soldering irons, um, yeah. uh, turns out most places that serve food don't want soldering irons in their restaurants. I'm not really sure why. It has nothing to do with the hazardous smoke that comes off. I mean, we're at least using lead-free solder. What do they want? So, also apparently, you know, 10, 15 people in a room with soldering irons doesn't sound like a very very appetizing to them for whatever reason. Um, 
it was suggested to me that we do actually uh, a back to basics when it comes to hardware and do a handful of workshops doing like just how to solder. Um, I don't know if anybody here would be interested in that one, given that tonight's talks about AI and ML, but. You know, maybe a little background on what we mean by workshop. Um, several years ago, did anybody remember Tech Shop? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what we did was about every, two or three times a year on a Saturday afternoon, we would post a workshop there, and that, it was a hands-on thing. Uh, we had pizza and beer and drinks and, there, and everything there, too. And uh, we, we all started out to perform a certain goal, to build something. And uh, we just sat there all afternoon and worked on it together. And that's uh, kind of what we're talking about getting back to here. Because we haven't done one of those in several years. Well, I think that about covers it for us tonight, doesn't it? Does anybody have any questions about anything? Yeah, yeah my question is about ESPI. That's not, that looks very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, two questions. Does it have Wi-Fi? Yes. Okay. And then the second question is, what's the power source? Do you need to put a battery? How do you uh, know? It's USB. USB? USB, yeah. Okay. What kind of applications are you thinking about? Uh, I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. okay. That's open for uh, suggestion. Okay. So in, in case those couldn't hear that, Dave's answers, the answer was, uh, yes, it does have Wi-Fi and you use USB power. Yes. As far as the applications of it, uh, the one I can think of right off the bat is with that little device, we may be able to duplicate, like, ring doorbell or something. Facial recognition right there. Very similar. Yeah. That's the only one that comes to mind right off the bat. We have a question in the back here. See why we couldn't do that. Yeah. It'd be something we definitely would the be coming. Created, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you do create that, my, my uh, cards are on the back. Uh, Dave, we have two more questions in the front. Uh, he asked if it's a 1080p camera on the ESPI. Uh, I didn't read that spec. I know it's. I think it's a two megapixel camera. So I, I don't know what that translates to on uh, the 1080p. I have a question if any one of you is familiar with the uh, framework that Siemens has. It's called MindSphere or MindConnect extensions. Siemens? Nobody? I used to work for Siemens, but I don't know. Ah, you don't know what they do in Dubai on the Expo this year? Well, they said Siemens, uh, the Expo in Dubai will be the most connected place in the world this year. Wow. And it's Siemens MindSphere. Hmm. So maybe we should look into that one too. Okay. Can you send that to me? Yeah. Uh, this is also a, just a comment. Um, this year at South by Southwest, there will be a heavy, fantastic future track. And if you want to get in and not pay, they're, volu they're taking volunteer starting Sunday. They'll show up for volunteer registration. 48 hours gets you a full interactive badge. What? Say it again. 48 hours? Yeah, 48 hours, 48, a little bit more, gets you a badge and then you can do it. And you got three weeks to fill your 48 hours and they use it. They have thousands of positions, so won't, they won't run out. Cool, thank you. So, uh, speaking of South Bay Southwest, uh, when I was talking about Sophia, I failed to mention that Sophia made her world debut here in Austin at South, in South by Southwest 2016. I thought that was pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Carew from Close Reach Communications. A few years ago, um, I wrote a fuzzy logic engine. 
and it's been used in a, a few different things. We didn't talk about fuzzy logic here, but it's, it's considered part of the AI sphere. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a fuzzy logic engine that I own. It's, it's written in several different languages, and I'm actually looking for some additional applications. So if anybody is interested in doing some fuzzy logic stuff, come and see me. Cool. Would you be interested in giving a presentation on that? Could be. Cool. Reach out to me. All right. Got anything else? I think that's all we got to it. Any other questions, anybody? Well, we'd certainly like to thank you for enduring this presentation. We hope you found it uh, at least reasonably useful. I didn't see anybody falling asleep, so that's a good sign. But uh, yeah, please. Uh, we talked about a lot of things tonight and a lot of possible future directions for the group. Please feel free, if you don't hear me respond to any of the things that we talk about, feel free to reach out to me and remind me. And uh, yeah, we're going to push this forward into 2020. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Oh, it's a good few years ago now. I, I worked for the telecommunications division. I was in Florida and I used to go to Munich a few times. Uh, no, no, I uh, joined a startup company in. Uh, uh, um, I so after Siemens, I actually yeah. that's because it's a little mind is it? Uh, uh, years ago now, but, uh, I was doing uh, a lot of uh, architecture, software architecture. It was a plugin. Join company in Dallas doing ATM architectures at the time, switching architectures. And then I came to Austin by the startup company, which was acquired by Cisco, and I was doing DSL equipment. It was their systems and software architecture and since then I've done a couple of other startups. Okay. I hate it when this happens. Just like, okay, I know I talked about that. Since 96. Thanks for coming. We had a better turnout than last year. Last year. Okay. Okay.